All right, today I will introduce to you how to analyze questionnaire data and also how to write it up because it's very important that you know how to present the data to somebody who doesn't know anything about it. And there are certain uh, principles to go about it. So the very first thing you will learn is how to code questionnaire data that you get. And number two, how to calculate frequency, percentage, and mean scores, because this is how we report the results. And lastly, you will learn how to write up the results for the questionnaire items. So the very first one is, let's see research in the whole picture. This is how research moves. First, you decide the aim of your study, aim and objectives. Then you look at the keywords you put inside there that will tell you what keywords to use and what kind of papers to read because you must know something about each of the keywords inside there. The keywords inside the aim and objectives are actually what we call the constructs or the variables. They are things we collect data on. And they also tell you what kind of method to use for your data collection, the keywords inside your aim and objectives. They will tell you the research design. If you write it well, it will also tell people, the participants, it suggests the instrument. It doesn't mention whether you're using questionnaire or interview, but when we read the words inside, we get an idea what instruments you might use to collect the data. Uh, of course, it doesn't have the detail of the data collection and data analysis, but we get an idea. If you can write your aim and objectives well, then you go on to collect data, you analyze data. So that's where we are focusing on today. We got the data. How are we going to analyze it and report it? So revise a little bit about what are questionnaires. Questionnaire is an instrument. Remember that it is an instrument, just like the interview guide. The list of questions is an instrument that you will use to collect data. And you collect data using questionnaire for at least three types of research design. Survey, where you study the whole population. You know the whole population. You know everybody inside there, but you may take a sample only certain percentage to study. That is called a survey because your target is the whole population. Even though you study a sample, your intention is to generalize and say, this is true about this whole population. And therefore, that selecting of the sample, uh, you need to follow certain principles, like uh, maybe random sampling. If too hard, maybe stratified sampling. Um, of course, the, the convenient sampling is not good, but people sometimes use it out of convenience and we call it purposive sampling because the people selected fulfill certain selection criteria. You purposely select them because they have certain, certain criteria that you're looking for. Then you also use questionnaire for correlational research design where you study the relationship between two variables or you use a questionnaire to collect data for descriptive research design where you're only interested in one variable and everything about it not necessarily connecting it to something else. So whenever you see the word questionnaire as an instrument, you must remember it could be the tool used for any one of the three research designs. So it doesn't mean questionnaire equals to one of them. It could be any one of them. That's when you need to read a bit more and find out what that study is all about. Now, two concepts you have studied before and you know about instruments must be valid must be reliable. Valid is like how you certify that this document is the real thing and nobody uh, fake any information on it. Certified through copy. Valid questionnaire means it studies what it is supposed to study. If your study is about A, the questionnaire must measure A. It cannot be B. The other concept about questionnaire is it must be reliable. Uh, that's when you work on the wording so that it is understood in the same way by different people. And therefore, the wording has to be simple. Other things like, you know, the items cannot be double barreled. It cannot be, how do you feel about A and B? Because then the responses will be mixed up for A and B. And there are a few more rules to make sure your items are reliable. That every time people respond, they will respond in about the same way. 
So that is reliability. Now, uh, pilot test. Why do we do this pilot test? Pilot test is just to try out on some people and you don't just give it to them and you leave them to their own devices. You sit with them so that when they fill it in, they have certain doubts, you know, even when they talk to themselves, you have to take note of what is it that puzzles them and they don't understand. You take note, uh, you go and change the wording. There is some problem there. Okay, so that is the purpose of pilot study, not so much to collect data like what some masters and PhD students think. Oh, it is to collect one set of data first. Uh, yes, you can probably use the, the data and maybe write a small paper, but the purpose of a pilot study is to make sure the items are worded properly so that other people can understand. Okay, so those are the basics about a questionnaire. Next, now jump forward. Already got the questionnaire. Now, already got the questionnaire data. Last time when it was the printed questionnaire, we have to key in one by one, you know. So now if you use Google online form, it comes as an Excel sheet. It comes as an Excel sheet, but you still have to code the data because when they answer male, female, they will, the answers will come as female, female, male, female, like that. You have to turn it into numbers so that uh, you can use Excel or later on, if you like, you can use SPSS for further analysis. That's what we call coding here. Turn the information into numbers. When you turn the information into numbers, uh, that one later, but before we go into that, okay? Uh, remember that when we use questionnaire as an instrument, we prefer to use closed-ended. That means there are certain items for them to choose from. Sorry, not item, options. It is like multiple choice. They choose one of them. If you give open-ended, normally it's only a few, like one or two in the whole questionnaire because then you have to do qualitative analysis. And that is not really the purpose of a questionnaire. A questionnaire is normally the research is like this. The researcher has already decided these are the possible ways how this question will be answered. And I give you all the possible ways and you select the most possible one that reflects you. Okay. Uh, so you could give yes, no kind of uh, item. Not so encouraged actually, but if you do, it will be coded as one zero or if you prefer one and two you can give the ranking kind of questions. Which of the following, which three of the following are the most important to you? Then they put one, two, three. But from my experience, participants are not used to it and they make a lot of mistakes. So I discourage you from using ranking questions also. The public out there are very familiar with the Likert scale where you ask them about strongly disagree, disagree, neutral, agree, strongly agree. Uh, this one, they are very used to it and you are encouraged to use this. You can choose to have only four options. That means there is no sitting on the fence. I did that for my PhD with a reason because I didn't want people to sit on the fence. Uh, that is one rationale, but you can choose to have the odd number, five options, seven options. Uh, because there are certain things that people have no stand. You cannot force them into a stand. Just for the sake of your questionnaire. So you can choose this one as your rationale. You can choose that one as your rationale, but you must have your reason for choosing four or five options or six or seven options. You might ask me why seven options? Why nine options? Well, it is like when you take a photo, certain cameras have better resolution, certain cameras have not so good resolution. So when you have better resolution, the, the pixels are more fine. You see more fine details. But you know that uh, seven options make it more difficult for people to make their choices. Okay, but it actually spreads the responses. So for the more educated respondents, you can give seven options. But for the less educated, it is already hard for them to make choices among the five given to them. So don't give seven. So there are many of these considerations. Okay, so if you have chosen the five options, you will code them as one, two, three, four, five. Okay, now. Here you see something that comes from a Google survey form in the form of an Excel sheet. You look at the top one first. You see uh, your gender, male, female. This is how it will appear. 
your age, I ask them to write down so it will appear like 39, 38, 37. Your ethnicity, I give them the options. They select Malay, Dayak or Chinese and other, others, I might put Indian as well. But here I only show you Dayak, Malay because the first three respondents are like that. Income, um, I put there in brackets, keep this question if you are a student or unemployed. No, nowadays I learned that you better put the very first option is I am not working. Then they take that one rather than uh, they skip the question. Then you will allow other people to skip the question and you lose valuable data. Okay. Now we move into the real items because the first four are only the demographic characteristics. Move into the first one. I like to work in groups. Strongly agree, agree, disagree. These are the responses of the first three respondents. Number two, I like my parents to make decisions for me. Strongly disagree, disagree, neutral. Okay, so how do we code it? We turn words into numbers. You have to put it into your first row, you know, so that you remember. Don't put it elsewhere. Put it into the first row. Your gender, one female, two male. Follow certain order, like alphabetical order. It helps you to remember. Your ethnicity, one Chinese, two Dayak, three Malay. Example, okay, like this. Salary, one less than 2,000. Two is 2,000 to 3,999. Three is... 4,000 to 5,999 and continue. But here I only do sample until three. You know that my highest one is uh, 8,000 and above. You can see in the table above. Number one, eh, I like to work in groups. One, strongly disagree. Two, disagree. Three, neutral. Four, agree. Five, strongly agree. So you will code this like that. Okay. Now I want to ask you. Number two, with the question mark, what are the codes you will put down? Can I have some responses? Hmm? Uh, could you repeat the question, doctor? <laughs> Kim, you see the number two there, I put question mark. What, what would you quote the responses from the first table above? The, uh, the scale uh, the scale is given down here in red color. Don't make your own scale. I have done number one for you. I want you to do number two. And the scale is given in number one down here. How can the first one be five? Five was put for strongly agree. The response given by participant one for number two is strongly disagree. Yeah, Meliana, one, two, three is correct. Right. Thank you. Mm. Yes. So now we have coded, assume all the items from one to five. Then we can ask the Excel to count the number of times one appears the number of times two appears and so on. Okay, so if you use this equation here, so-called the command equals count if B2 to B312, comma one, that means you are asking Excel to count from the co column B, column B, row number two, to row 312 and only look for number one. The column B, the first column A is actually just the participant number one, two, three, you see on your left hand side. The second column is labeled as your gender. 
one female, two male, that is column B. Column C is your age, column D is your ethnicity. So we ask them to count from row number two because the row one is used by me to put in all the details of the codes. So the first participant is in row number two until the last one is in row 312. That means there are 311 respondents. Okay, so it will count the number of ones. So you know how many females there are inside your data set. And then the second one, comma two, that means it will count number two. That means you know the number of males in your data set very fast. Okay. Next, you after you have put in this command for row uh, for column B, you can just put your cursor at the corner and you drag across C, D, E, F, G, H all the way to Z, even to A, B and so on. It will count the number of ones, count the number of twos. I know the column B has only one and two, but there is no harm for you to ask it to count until uh, six or seven because your salary probably has six or seven, um, six or seven uh, scales inside there. So some of them will come out as zero. It's okay, you know that there are not so many gender divisions. You only ask for two of them. But it will give you the numbers for all the six and seven, whichever is applicable, all right? So you drag across, but you cannot drag down. You have to copy the command and uh, make sure that the one gets changed to two, changed to three, changed to four, and so on. If you, you drag down, it's going to... Uh, make things wrong, but you can drag across with no problem. Okay, here I show you where you can find the count if. You don't have to write the command, but once you click this here, more functions, statistical, count if as, uh, you will see the command that I put there just now, and you can also see here in front of you. Equals count if K70 to K312, comma 2. That means we are asking it to count column K, the number of times this number two appears, the code number two. You can see here in the blue color, those are the counting they have done, uh, Excel has done. So you see 13, 9, 3, 43, 0, 0, 0. So we have uh, 13 persons chose one. There are 13 students in column F here. Uh, there are nine unemployed, three something else, 43 something else. There are no more others, they are all zero. And the next column also has the frequency. After this underlying here, you see a 68. Uh, this is probably the total of what is above here. And then you see uh, 3.12, this is the average. And you see 1.24, that is the standard deviation. That means how much variability from the average. Of course, not everybody answers three, you know, 3.12 is a little bit on the positive side. That means a few more people click uh, agree. Of course, this is an average. There will be people who click strongly disagree. There will be people who click strongly agree, but this gives you an average. And you know that for this group, most of them are marginally positive 3.12 because it is the scale of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 3 point something is above the 3, so it's a little bit positive. And 1.24 tells us that there are actually people who disagree about 2 and there are people who strongly agree uh, 4 plus plus. So down below, I have calculated percentage. So we know 13 equals to 19.12%. So you can make Excel do all these calculations for you. Uh, you just go to more functions, statistical, and you choose what is necessary there. Okay. It's very nice. Excel does the job for you. So calculating frequency and percentage. Yes, this can calculate for you, but I want you to know how to calculate as well from a table that is made for you. So here, you must remember every time you have a table, you need to put the table headings. Table 1, Table 2, Table 3 in one line. 
The next line is the name of that table. Frequency showing characteristics of Zeng Z participants. N equals to 243. Just now the 68 you saw were the Zeng Y participants. Okay. First item, I like to get personal attention. Strongly disagree, five. Disagree, 27. Neutral, 83. Agree, 97. Strongly agree, 28. So we know that a lot of the Zen Z participants like to get personal attention, although there were many sitting in the middle. So if you calculate the percentage, you don't take the 243, just like that. You know, because certain items are not filled in, if you add this up, it is not 243. It is actually only 240. Okay. Overall, yes, 243, but not all of them add up to 243. This one is only 240. So you need to calculate the frequency out of 240. Five divided by two hundred uh, five divided by two hundred forty times one hundred will give you two point zero eight percent. This is the more accurate percentage than if you calculate out of two hundred forty three. It's not correct. The blue color above, if you calculate like that, it will not add up to one hundred percent. But down here, it will add up to one hundred percent. Now, what if you use Excel and just ask it to calculate the average? Which one do you think it will give you, the blue or the black? What I have calculated for you just now is what we call the mean score. It's, it's just average, you know? So how do you calculate the mean score if you are given a table like this? Uh, this is something you need to learn, even though you don't have to calculate it, but when you read a paper and they only use uh, numbers like what you see here in the white table, how do you know what is the mean score? Because if you just look at the neutral 83, agree 97, strongly agree 28, you don't know where this group is sitting. So let's calculate the mean score. So what you do is we have a certain code. Strongly disagree is one. Disagree is, uh, sorry, yeah, two. Neutral three agree four, strongly agree five. So what do you do? I have put in color already. Five times one plus 27 times two plus 83 times three plus 97 times four plus 28 times five. Altogether added up, you get a certain number, 836. And you must divide by actual number, which is 240. So the mean score is 3.43 for this item here. How to interpret the 3.43? Yes, you report it, but what does it mean? It is above the midpoint of three on a scale of one to five. So the people are marginally positive on wanting personal attention. And the people here are the Zen Z participants. They like to have personal attention but not everybody says that. That's why the score is not 4.9. The score is 3.43 only. Certain people still shy away from getting personal attention. So this is the meaning of the mean score. It is a very uh, fast way to know the general patterns for a group. Questionnaire data are collected because we want to know the pattern for the group. We are not so interested in individuals. Oh, this person answer strongly disagree for every item, but somehow it's not reflected in the overall results. Yeah, sorry. In questionnaire results, we are not interested in the minority. We are interested in the majority patterns. Okay, so just now what I have shown you is how to calculate the mean score for one item. Then, then this is the other concept. You may have one section that has five items. You can actually calculate a mean score for that five items together, you get an average. For example, I had Zen Z participants who fill in one section on their study preferences. 
I had them to fill in another section on the communication style. So I can add up my five items for the study preferences and say, generally, Zen Z participants like this thing as shown by the overall mean score. Uh, I think you need to use the word overall mean score to differentiate it for the mean score for each of the items because now you are doing average for the five items for everybody inside that group. Okay, uh, the 240 of Zen Z participants. So the next one is the section on communication style. You can add up the five items or the 10 items and you divide it by the number, you get the overall mean score and it tells you a certain communication style. Okay, so it is also very useful in this manner. So when you get responses in a questionnaire, you can process it at different levels. It is not just going to report it according to the frequency or second stage, you report it according to percentage. Or third stage is mean score. You can process it further, go to the fourth stage and calculate for the whole section. That's why we ask you to divide a questionnaire uh, into its sections, each section for something, for a certain construct, next section for a different construct, so that you can calculate the overall mean score. But, but there is something else. You know, certain items are in the opposite direction. Okay, you must be careful. The items go in the opposite direction, and that's when you have to do reverse coding before you calculate the mean. You look at these three items here. Example, item one, it is important for graduates to be good in English, positive. Item two, it is important for graduates to have good teamwork skills. If you agree, it's positive. Item three, it is important for graduates to ask for deadline extension. If you agree, this is a bad thing. So it's the opposite direction. So if you agree to item three, uh, agree, uh, agree is uh, four. In the reverse coding, you have to make it two. Okay. You see how I explain it here? When respondents agree to items one and two, they agree to a good characteristic. But when they agree to item three, they agree to a bad characteristic and you need to do reverse coding. And I would advise you to write down what I have put down here on a piece of paper before you do the reverse coding because you are going to confuse yourself. In principle, it's very easy. One becomes five, two becomes four. Three stays, neutral is neutral. There is nothing to change. Four becomes two, five becomes one. Uh, but when you actually change it on the Excel sheet, you'll be careful because when you start to change all the one to five, now you have the new five and the old five. The Excel cannot differentiate them. So what I do myself is, I will change the strongly disagree one to the words strongly agree first. And then when I have done everything for already, then I will change the word strongly agree to five. How do I do that? Well, I just use the function available to me, find and replace, okay? But you need to write this down so that you don't confuse yourself. All right, assume you have done all that, you have done, done all the count if, you have done the total, you have done the mean, the standard deviation, percentage, whatever you need to do, let's say you have done. Now we will write up the results. So you have this table here. This is under section 4.1, general characteristics of Zen Y and Zen Z. The t-test shows no difference. That means the two groups are the same, whether they are a little bit younger, uh, like you, a little bit older who have worked outside there for up to 15 years. First thing, when you make a table, you have to rearrange according to a certain order, best from highest to lowest, as shown by the pink arrow. The mean, or seven all the way down to 2.60. This will help you to report the results in a more meaningful way. I just decided to follow the uh, Zeng Y 
I know the Zen Z, maybe the order is slightly different. Doesn't matter, you follow one of it and normally we follow the one closest uh, to us. So it will be Zen Y first. So you rearrange them. But you must, of course, remember that the items probably come from certain patterns that you had before this. So you must remember which one is about what. So then when you talk about it later in the results, you remember where they belong. We do not just describe from number one to number 11. That would be very mechanical, like robot, not meaningful. Okay, how do you start writing? The very first sentence should be, Table 2 shows the characteristics of Zen Y and Zen Z participants. Tell the purpose of the results. Then give the main patterns. The mean score is a good way to give the mean pattern. Okay, uh, main patterns. You see this? Both groups express strong opinions that they like clear rules. Zen Y m equals to 4.47 then z m equals to 4.45 you know very close to five that means they really like clear rules uh, that is where the mean score is the overall mean score what does this mean then this means that they like structure in their life they like they like things to be clear to them it means that the Zen Y and Zen Z participants do not like ambiguity and gray areas. In the organization, rules and regulations have to be clearly spelled out, making the rights and obligations plain. This also means they abhor disregard for rules and preferential treatment. So you explain the meaning of the results. This is very important. This is called the explanation part, the one that is put in a box with the mean score, that is the result part. It must be followed by the explanation of the meaning. Then after this, we will go into each of the items that you see in the table here. So I end with this one, the rules on writing up questionnaire results. Number one, start by saying what the table shows. Number two, give the main results. The main point, the main point just now is both Zen Y and Zen Z are similar. They like clear rules. Some other cases are the results mostly positive or negative. You see what the main pattern is. If you have two groups or three groups, like just now you have two groups, Zen Y and Zen Z, then we talk about whether the results are the same for the two groups. If they are different, say they are different because subsequently you are going to explain anyway whether they are the same or different. So number four, you go into the detailed description of the results. Uh, some people may copy and paste 11 times because there were 11 items. No, no, don't do that. Or some people mistakenly thought that they should only describe the first two and the last two. This is wrong. There's no such thing. There's no such rule. You Number five, the last rule is you look at the grouping of the results. Are there certain patterns? Some things are positive, some items are around the neutral part, and some are around the negative. It is good to describe them in three groups. Then you can make comparisons. What is very positive? Later on, what is very negative? And where is it that most people are like undecided or um, sitting in the middle? This is when you have meaningful comparisons. And of course, I also taught you how to calculate overall mean score. If you have sections on communication, sections on group work, and sections on decision making, it is good to calculate overall mean score for the three. And maybe you should separate these items into three different tables to talk about them. Because after you have described the information for communication, for group work, and for decision making, you can bring the three together in the end when you finish off the description of your results and talk about which one are they most positive about or do they agree the most for the three. Because we are talking about Zen Y, Zen Z with respect to their studies and to their work. Always remember the context and bring it back there when you do the explanation. So hopefully with this, then you will know how to write up your results in the way that is 
meaningful for other people, not just for yourself who process the results. All right. Thank you very much.